Um, welcome to Oxford Philosophy of Physics. Um, I'm particularly happy to uh, welcome John Norton as our speaker today. Um, John has um, done so much work in the foundations and history of general relativity, special relativity to Einsteinian studies more generally, that it's almost become his personal uh, field, um, but also in the statistical mechanics um, and uh, large areas in philosophy of science. Um, but I think one of the things I would like to say on behalf of the community, since we've got you here, John, um, at the Thursday seminar is a heartfelt thanks for what you did some 20 years ago um, in setting up the Pittsburgh Archive for Philosophy of Science. And uh, it's, it's a magnificent thing for our field. Um, and we're all of us tremendously grateful to you for it, even though we don't always tell you how grateful we are. Um, John, though, has also got a, a new book coming out and he's doing another service for the community and uh, being sure to make it open um, access as a book, which is a sort of problematic thing um, and it needs senior figures to do this. And he's going to launch his new book, The Material Theory of Induction, which will be coming out um, hopefully within the next 12 months. I, I think that's a reasonable estimate, is it, John? Uh, anyway, I'm speaking far too long. Let me introduce our speaker. Um, John is going to talk to us today um, on how to make um, modalities safe for empiricists. Uh, uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Simon. It's, it's a pleasure to be here virtually, and uh, I'm enormously grateful for all the, you know, all the people who, who, who've shown up. This is a little bit out of the normal line of things that you're, you talk about in this you know, in, in the seminar, so I'm especially pleased to see so many people coming. All right, let me uh, take over the screen and, and start the PowerPoint, and let's see how, how, this, how this works. So there's that, and let's start this. Now at this point, you should see a full screen image of the first slide of the PowerPoint. Is that, is that right? And you can hear me clearly. I, I was going to use headphones, but I, I'm, are they needed, do you think? Or? No, I think we are doing fine and we're hearing you very clearly. Okay, then I, then I will uh, leave things as they are. Uh, before I uh, get into the slides, uh, I, I want to um, uh, say, uh, just a, a little bit about how I came to work on this particular topic. Uh, it came out of a sense of frustration that's been building in me over the last, oh, even maybe one or two decades. Uh, over that time, I've heard lots of talk about possibility and necessity, and it's been growing. Uh, I've uh, accommodated it. I think I know what possibility and necessity means, and I hear people talking about it, and I think I know what they're talking about. But then doubts start to creep in. Then people start to talk about what's possible and what's necessary in ways that I realize I don't understand. The key moment for me is when someone says that something is not just possible, but metaphysically possible and they put the emphasis on the word metaphysically possible. And it's at that point that I realize I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the metaphysically is adding uh, to, the, uh, to the possible. So every now and again, I'll, you know, this isn't happening in idle chatter or something. I'll, I'll, I'll say that, I'll say, look, I, I didn't really understand what happened there. What is the metaphysical ad, what, 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 what's happening here? And you know, I'm expecting a simple answer, but I never get it. Instead, I get this very awkward look uh, as someone's having a thought that says, uh-oh, how do I explain adult things to someone who has the mind of a child? Right? And so of course, it, it, I, I, never, I never really get something that, that's, that's satisfying. Maybe some of you are on the other side of this conversation and had that experience of thinking, what, what do I say to him? What do I say? Um, so, okay, I decided I've got, to, I've got to sort this out. So I sat down and, and tried seriously to think about, well, what, what can we mean by possibility and necessity? And how does that fit with what is out there uh, in, in the uh, uh, existing uh, literature? So uh, this talk is then the result of, of what came from those efforts. There is a paper that's attached to it. Uh, you can get it on my website and I'll remind you of this at the end of the talk. I'll mention now that this is still work in progress. This is fresh work. 
So uh, if you have helpful thoughts, uh, now really is the time to pass them on to me. I'd be very grateful for anything you can tell me. Okay, so let's get, let's go, get on with it then. Um, how to make possibility safe for empiricists. I am an empiricist. I take an empiricist approach to it. So this will be an empirical counter possibility and you'll see how, that, how all of that works out. So let me start to move through. So what's this talk going to be? It will be an empiricist account of, uh, of, 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 of possibility. The central claim is going to be the following. There are just two notions of possibility that can be used responsibly. Uh, they are empirical and logical possibility. They're the only well-founded notions. There are, of course, a, a bunch of other notions out there in the literature, conceptual, metaphysical, gnomic, physical, epistemic, I'm going to argue that insofar uh, uh, as they have anything to add, they have nothing that's well founded to add to the, these, uh, these accounts. So it's a, um, it's a strong account, it's quite imperialistic. I'm saying this is the only stuff that works, nothing, uh, nothing else does. Uh, and then towards the end, I'm going to look at some of the, uh, the properties of this notion of empirical possibility. And I'm going to argue that much of the standard machinery that's used in philosophical circles to talk about possibility actually doesn't work when it applies to, to this idea. So for example, there's a familiar duality of possibility and uh, necessity. That for example, uh, is not always going to be upheld. It will sometimes fail. Okay. So the first item on the agenda then is to give you a brief sense of what the idea of empirical possibility is that I'm going to be uh, talking about. There'll be more details later, but I, want to, I just want to get on the, uh, on, on the table, uh, you know, the, ba the basic idea. This is the view in brief. Uh, it's an empiricist account. And I want to emphasize the sort of empiricism that's involved here is a very modest sort of empiricism. I call it small e empiricism. Uh, it is the view that we can only learn contingent truths of the world from experiences of the world. So I have no hesitation in saying as a small e empiricist that we can certainly learn of inner truths of, 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 of particle physics. We can certainly learn that there truly are quarks. I have no problem with that at all. You would contrast that with what I call big E empiricism, empiricism which is a much more doctrinaire notion. That says the only thing that we can learn uh, about the world is what we experience directly. Uh, and, and as a result, we cannot know literally that there are quarks. Um, quark talk is some kind of constructive instrumentalist talk, whatever variety you like. So to be clear, this is the version of empiricism that's motivating the talk. I expect very many of you have this sort of empiricism. It's pretty mild. Not everyone does, but I don't think it's an extreme view. Uh, and I'm not going to be pursuing this view. This is not the basis of, of, uh, of the talk. It's not a strict uh, big E empiricism. Okay, uh, so what is empirical possibility briefly? It's simply this, what's possible right, is what our evidence positively allows and what's necessary is what our evidence compels. Right? So uh, these are the key ideas. So I'll say them again, what's possible is what our evidence positively allows and what's necessary is what our evidence compels, All right? Simple, fairly simple uh, no notion there. Uh, so uh, a few remarks about that. Uh, notice that the evidence has to be positively relevant. It's not merely that something is compatible with the evidence at hand. Uh, it there has to be some kind of positive relevance of the evidence. Right? Uh, another notion, it's relational. Possibility claims are always relative to some body of, uh, of evidence uh, and it's gradational. There are wide uh, ranges of strengths of possibility from the barely minimally possible at the most extremely unlikely end all the way through to, to, to very great strengths of possibility. All of that inherited directly from strengths of evidence. So there's no mystery where these particular notions are coming from. Uh, 
Now, for completeness, I'll mention the second idea, uh, logical possibility. I won't speak too much about this, but I think it's a necessary inclusion in any account of possibility and necessity because it comes up so often. Uh, so what's possible or a proposition is, uh, asserts a possibility uh, if its truth is compatible with the meaning of the terms in the proposition. So for example, my tomato is red, uh, that's possible. It's possible because a tomato being red is, com is compatible with the meaning of the, in this case, the term tomato and red. Uh, what's necessary? Well, a necessary proposition is one whose truth follows inexorably from the meaning of the terms in the, in the proposition. So my tomato is a fruit, right? Uh, uh, that's necessary because uh, uh, tomatoes are by definition the fruiting body of certain plants. So if the thing is not a fruit, right, it's, um, uh, it, it, it can't be a, a tomato. Okay, so the claim is that's it. I've now told you all the responsible uses of, of possibility and necessity uh, that, I'm going to be, that, I, that I'm going to be considering. Um, so uh, I now, with that in hand, go on a quest. I want to find out, is there another notion? Are there further notions of possibility that somehow outstrip these? Right? So, this is, uh, so this is my quest. Now, the quest has some restrictions on it. Right? I'm, not, uh, I'm not interested in every possible way that one might like to use the word, uh, uh, the, the word possibility. So, so let me narrow it down a little so you know what I'm hunting. Um, there are candidates here, of course, uh, that we're looking for, and this is just a short list of, it doesn't, I'm sure, I'm sure pick up everything, but it picks up a lot of the literature, conceptual, metaphysical, gnomic, physical, and epistemic. And what I'm looking for in this list of candidates is something that satisfies the following. I'm looking for notions of possibility and necessity that are in the world, right? the possibilities of things in the world. I'm not interested in notions of possibility that depend essentially on how we use language. Right? I'm looking for notions that are independent of language. I'm not looking for notions that somehow depend essentially on the way we think or the way we believe or what, we, or, or what beliefs we, we have. I'm looking for notions of possibility and necessity uh, that are independent uh, of that. Now, I don't, um, I, I don't preclude uh, language and thought dependent notions of possibility and necessity as being something that one can investigate. Um, I like to think that the first is the sort of thing that a linguist would, uh, would pursue and the second is the sort of thing for empirical psychologists to, uh, uh, to worry about. And to keep you oriented on my thinking, lurking in the background of this quest will always be the perennial question of an empiricist. How do we know this? I will be asking, how do we know this? How do we know this? Okay, so let's have a look at some of the candidates here. Uh, the paper that I've mentioned goes through them all in somewhat great, greater detail, but I can, I can identify a few as being of lesser interest for what's going to happen and then, and then focus on the ones that I think are more likely to, to be uh, drawing a, a, a attention. Uh, conceptual possibility. Uh, the way uh, I've defined logical possibility, they are just the same thing, and that's fine, uh, insofar as uh, the conceptual and the logical possibility coincide. I have no, no, um, uh, no issues with it. Uh, gnomic and physical possibility, well, these pertain to things that we learn empirically about the world, so they come out as being uh, the same thing as empirical possibilities. Uh, I do not hold a governing uh, conception of, of laws. I take laws simply to be uh, empirical, uh, um, to be contingent truths learned empirically that happen to have very, very wide uh, scope. There's more that can be said on that, but I don't think that's where the concerns are going to be. Uh, I think that the two cases that need most attention from me are metaphysical and epistemic possibilities. So let me talk a bit about them. Let's start out with metaphysical possibility, the one that puzzled me the most. So picture a simple-minded empiricist like me going to the uh, metaphysics literature with the question, I hear you talk about it, I want to know what it is. What is, what is metaphysics? And I think you all know that the you know, first discussion in any serious discussion of metaphysics is always saying something like, it is not easy to say what it is. And there's a fairly labored discussion telling you just how just how hard it is to, to specify. It's not encouraging for someone like me to be told that 
the experts don't, don't really know what they're talking about, but okay, I, I hang in there. We of course have Aristotle, it's being qua being. I'm not enough of an Aristotle scholar to be able to get terribly much out of that. I get some sort of idea. Uh, Peter van Enwagen is I think one of the leading metaphysicians of our, of our age and, and in his book on metaphysics he eventually settles in on this as the best definition he can find and I find it quite congenial. Metaphysics is the study of ultimate reality and that is great because that's what I want to know about, ultimate reality. Boy, that's, that's the guy. So what happens when you then look for metaphysical notions of possibility and necessity? This is what they look like. This is Gandler and Hawthorne uh, talking about metaphysical possibility. They say, quote, it's taken as the most basic conception of how things might have been. Good. And here's Kit Fine giving another definition. Uh, it would take more of a God to break a connection that was merely metaphysic, uh, that was merely metaphysically necessary. Sorry. It would take more of a God to break a connection that was metaphysically necessary uh, than one that was uh, naturally necessary. Okay, great, I'm sold, that's, that's what I want. I want ultimate reality. So off I go and I'm now, you know, this, this is truly autobiographical. I'm now reading in the literature and I'm looking for what are the notions then, what are the cases that are gonna instantiate this? And what I found uh, is that the literature divides up roughly into three pieces. Right. And I'll go through each piece. And as you can probably predict, I'm not going to be happy. So the first is uh, traditional metaphysics of the type that goes back to the scholastics and certainly earlier on. Uh, if you've had some exposure to this and you have any kind of empiricist uh, inclinations, you find it very unsatisfactory. To give you a flavor of the repeated problem, uh, let me just talk through one example of it, one of the core examples. It's the traditional ontological argument for the existence of God. Uh, the premise is that to exist is more perfect than not to exist. And the conclusion is then that the most perfect being necessarily exists. Well, I look at this and I think, ah, um, there seems to be a lot of uh, free play here that one could produce lots of arguments that look like this that have different conclusions. So just in the spirit of play, uh, let me give you the empiricist version of the argument. Uh, my experience of the world is that to be more perfect uh, is to be less likely to exist. So I have lots and lots of experiences of imperfect spheres around things, uh, and they're far more likely to come up than, uh, uh, than perfect spheres, right? Um, so I have this premise to be more perfect is to be less likely to exist. And so from that you conclude by parity of argument that the most perfect being is the least likely to exist. I don't offer this as a serious argument. It's not a serious argument. And that of course is the whole problem. I don't think any of these can be taken seriously as arguments. Uh, Van Inwagen in his chapter on the ontological argument struggles mightily to see if there's some way to rescue the argument and, uh, uh, and he's unable to do so. He says that all versions of it, I've given you the quote here, all versions have some logical error or a premise uh, uh, whose claim to truth we're unable to, uh, uh, to, uh, to adjudicate. Um, this would not be worrisome if the ontological argument were week old, uh, but it is many, many centuries old uh, and it's, it's not working. Okay. So I'll, I'll move on because that isn't the case that I think most people are interested in here. It might be this one. Um, the idea that we can get necessity from uh, rigid designation in the theory of meaning. This seems to be one of the strongest examples that I ran into. The canonical examples are quite familiar. Water, uh, uh, the term water necessarily designates H2O. Gold is necessary, the element. Uh, 79. I'm drawing this directly from the work of, of Saul Kripke, who's been the, the, the instigator and founder of this tradition of thought. Uh, this is how he conceives of the notion of, of necessity here. He says, I don't just mean physically necessary, but necessary in the highest degree. Right? And, and of course, he attaches this to metaphysics. It's not a notion of epistemology, uh, but a, a, a notion of, uh, of metaphysics. 
Now, this is where I am lost. I simply, you know, not for lack of trying, I just don't get how those claims are sustained. Now, I look at the example for, take gold is necessarily uh, element 79, and I can see certain, certain facts, right, that are possibility and, and necessity sustaining, right? Uh, um, they are, there are two of them. One is an empirical fact that substances are best divided by atomic number. You've got all sorts of you know, convenience out of, out of that for our physical theorizing, right? Um, I think it is the case that, that, you know, that the elements are distinguished uh, most fundamentally uh, by their atomic number. I don't have any sense of, uh, of, uh, of compulsion that, ne that nature necessarily has to do it that way, right? It's simply an empirical fact that we've learned it is the case. I don't see why it would necessarily have to be the case. Uh, then there's a second claim. Uh, it's a convention of language. Uh, we call matter with atomic number 79 gold. And uh, there's a fairly strong insistence, I take it, that we must do it that way. This is a convention of our language that is not easily breached. If I, if I try and give you some iron parietes and tell you it's gold, no, you, you'll complain. No, it's, this is not the guy with atomic number 79. I can see those two facts and I can see how they can authorize uh, possibilities and, and necessities. But when you add the term metaphysical, what's been added? I don't see anything can be added to that, right? Responsibly. Okay, I expect we might come back to this later. Then there's a third sense of possibility. Uh, and this is one that I'm actually very sympathetic to. This is the idea that if you want to figure out how the world is fundamentally, you go to our best science. If you want to know how is space and time fundamentally, you go to our theories of relativity. If you want to know how matter is, you go to our, you go to our quantum theories. If you want to know what life is, you go to biology. If you want to know what thought is, you go to cognitive science and neuroscience. Great. I'm very much in favor of that. Here's an example of this, an example of the metaphysics of space and time. There's a lot of writing in the metaphysics literature in this vein, right? You'll find this type of thing all, all, all over the place. So one example is the following. Um, if as uh, relativity theory tells us near enough uh, for our space times that, that, uh, uh, that space and time form a Minkowski space time, uh, then there is no unique relation of simultaneity across space. To say that these two events were simultaneous right, uh, is a, a frame dependent result and, uh, and there's no unique statement of that independent of the choice of an inertial frame of reference. That's terrific. That's just the way things should be done, but this is just empirical possibility. We discover these, these new results. You know, uh, at one time, if we thought that necessarily uh, um, our space time had to be Minkowski and along comes uh, general relativity and we discover, no, it's only approximately so in various uh, places. So far, so good. Then something happens that, that isn't good, then this responsible sort of foundational talk gets mixed in with talk that does not have a good empirical foundation. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, an example of that is that this argument has been used for the longest time to justify the claim uh, that the future is as real as the present. Those of you who know the argument will know it's a few, a few steps juggling with relativity simultaneity to give it to you. And there's been a transition that's happened here. We've now moved from empirical claims uh, to claims that of their nature are beyond empirical investigation. Right? Uh, there doesn't seem to make any difference to anything we experience in the world as to whether the future is real or not. It all seems to simply come down to how we attach a label, uh, real, not real, uh, to, uh, to future events. So what I regret is that these two literatures have been blended together and I think we should separate them. And in an effort to do that, I want to distinguish empirical metaphysics, which is of the first type. Right? This is when you, you learn about the world through empirical investigations. I'd say that conforms with uh, the notion of empirical possibility. And then there's another thing that I'll call non-empirical metaphysics. And there you seek uh, uh, to understand the ultimate realities of the, of the world by methods other than empirical investigation. This has been a traditional endeavor going back for a very, very long time. Uh, it hasn't worked. 
I think time and time again, it simply fails. It produces results that are false, right? Or that turn out to be falsified by the, uh, by the latest science. And if you, if you think about it, it couldn't work, right? One of the things that we've learned about science is it has this extraordinary ability to turn up new results that are just so completely unexpected, so completely beyond what we ever, what we ever imagined. Someone doing non-empirical metaphysics is trying to anticipate all of this. Uh, it just isn't going to work. Okay. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Norton, you haven't tried hard enough. There's a big literature out there, and there are lots and lots of examples, and you need to pay more attention to them. I've tried. So let, let me show you one example that I, uh, that I came across. Ted Sider uh, wanted to explain rapidly to people, to give a quick sense of what metaphysical impossibilities look like. And so he came up with a list. All right, so here's the... Uh, 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 here's the list, I've, you've got the citation there. Uh, these are examples of metaphysical impossibilities. And, and this was great because, okay, I've got something very concrete and very definite. These are canonical examples that I can use to refine my thinking. Uh, so let's go, go down the list and see what they are. Uh, metaphysically impossible for someone being taller than himself. Well, no, that's just a logical impossibility because you define the relation of taller than as irreflexive. If you made, if you replaced it with, you know, being no taller than, uh, then it would be reflexive and that'd be fine. So it's just a logical possibility. What about someone being in two places at once? Well, um, quantum mechanics has got a, got a interesting message for us here. Uh, this, you know, this happens to electrons all the time in so far as we can make any sense of it. And uh, if, we, if we think in terms of, uh, of macroscopic superpositions, then maybe it's happening at the, uh, um, at the macroscopic uh, uh, scale as well. So that's just, that's just a falsehood. It's, it's not even an impossibility. Uh, um, you know, to say that it's impossible is wrong because it happens. Uh, George W. Bush being a donkey. This one perplexes me greatly. It's the sort of example that comes up a lot. It goes back to Kripke who, made, who uses Nixon in, instead of George W. Bush. It is, as far as I can see, a pure convention of language, right? Um, but then I'm told, no, 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 it's not, you know, so I say someone could call their cat George W. Bush, what's the problem? Right? No, 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 I'm told that isn't it. It's something about the being that is identified by George W. Bush. That being could not be a donkey. And there I'm just at a loss. It, it is the case that that being is not a donkey. That, that certainly is the case. But how did we go from that to could not be a, a, a donkey? Something happened and I have no idea what happened. I grant the ears. I don't see any basis for the, for the could. There's, there's, there's a structure missing to explain where that could is coming from. There exists no numbers. Well, I'll stay away from that one because this is something that philosophers of mathematics worry about and they don't seem to be able to make up their minds whether numbers exist or not. Uh, all I can say is this is certainly not the beginner's example on which you would try and uh, hone your intuitions. You just fall into huge amounts of philosophy of mathematics. Uh, there existing some water that is not made of H2O. I talked about that, uh, that one earlier. Then there's this guy at the top of the list here, the existence of a round square. Well, what are we to, to do with that? Well, there's a way that we can uh, we can make it uh, uh, necessarily impossible. Uh, we can do that by defining square as a figure that has four pointy corners and other stuff. And if you define it as having four pointy corners, then it's just a, a matter of logical necessity that it can't be round because a pointy corner uh, logically contradicts round in the way that I would normally understand it. So if you want to give this a chance of having any substance to it, you need to find a definition of square that doesn't presuppose the very thing that you're, uh, that, you're, that you're claiming. And if you do that, odd things happen. So let me show you what happens. The definition I'll use of a square is a fairly benign one. A square is a geometric figure that has four straight line sides and is symmetric under 90 degree rotation. So here's the square and I'm rotating it 90 degrees and I, and I get back and I get back the uh, uh, the, 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 same, the same guy. Is it possible to have a round figure uh, that satisfies that, that, um, uh, that definition? Well, yes, if you go to spherical geometry, it, it can be done. So 
I think you all know what spherical geometry is, but let me just remind you. Um, it is the geometry that is native to the surface of a sphere. So here's a sphere. And on that sphere, uh, you'll see I've drawn a bunch of lines. Every single one of those is a straight line. It is a geodesic of the circle. It is the shortest distance. So AB here is a straight line because it's the shortest distance in the surface of the sphere between uh, the point A and the point B. And you can see that I've got a circle here, A, B, C, D is a circle because all of its points are equidistant from O, which is the center of the, uh, of the circle, uh, nothing mysterious. Uh, however, this very same figure is also a square. Uh, it satisfies the definition that I just gave of being a square, so we can match up the sides. Here's A, B, and C, D. These are straight lines. They correspond to the A, B, and C, D on the, of, the, of the Euclidean square. Here are the other two sides, right? Uh, and uh, here's the center. And now, of course, that's a, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that is a square and a circle at the same time. So in this geometry, you certainly can have round, uh, round squares. Those of you who are new to some of this might think, well, that's phony baloney, um, you know, philosophers hocus pocus. Uh, why should I care about that at all? We're, we're talking about reality here. We're not talking about things that you cook up in your imagination. Well, of course, the difficulty here is uh, that I'm actually not necessarily talking about imaginary things. Uh, the way modern cosmology is going, the geometry of space on the largest scale is an open question. And there are three possibilities. One of them is that the geometry of space on the largest scale is spherical, three-dimensional, dimensional, obviously not the two-dimensional surface of a, uh, of a sphere. Uh, and if, if that is the case, if that actually works out, that's a live possibility, uh, then not only are round squares possible, but they are actual. Uh, they're they're uh, uh, in, uh, in, our, in our space. Okay. So let's move on to the next uh, notion that I think uh, naturally attracts attention here. And that is the notion of epistemic possibility. Uh, it's very close to empirical possibility. Both pertain to what it is that we can know, right? Um, uh, and, and so you might expect that the two simply coincide, that, that, it, that, it's, uh, that there's no difference. But no, there are huge differences. Uh, and the basic claim I make about this is the following. Uh, they coincide in a lot, but where epistemic possibility goes beyond empirical possibility, it does not do so in a way that we should endorse. Right? We don't want the extras that it gives us. So here I've taken a, a definition of empirical possibility from a monograph on, on sorry, on, on, uh, on epistemic possibility from a monograph on epistemic uh, uh, modality. This is the first pass definition. There's lots of fine tuning that happens after this, but this is the basic idea. Uh, uh, possibility is an epistemic possibility if we do not know that it does not obtain. Right, that's, the, that's the idea. So let, let's compare the two. I've got epistemic possibility on the left and empirical possibility on the right. Uh, what's the first major difference? Well, the first major difference uh, is that epistemic possibility is defined in terms of belief states and knowledge, whereas empirical possi possibility by stipulation from the start Concerns with concerns matters that are independent of thoughts and beliefs. So I'm interested in uh, possibilities in the world, and insofar as shifting from things that are independent of thoughts and beliefs to beliefs adds anything, we don't want it. Right? So you can see, as far as I'm concerned, that that addition is cut off. Then there's a second thing. It's defined epistemic possibility is def excuse me is defined by a double negative. It's we do not know that it does not obtain. I emphasized for you early on uh, that empirical possibility requires positive evidence, even if incredibly weak. There just has to be some, uh, some sort of relevance there. Uh, does this matter? Does this make a difference? Uh, yes, it makes an enormous difference because it, uh, it uh, attributes uh, incredible creative modal powers to ignorance. So how does that work? Well, let me give you an example. So here's the proposition. There is a magical wizard with powers of levitation in a parallel universe causally disconnected from our own. I've, you know, I've tried to set this up 
in such a way that we have a proposition such that we have no possible evidence for it. If this, you know, if the details of this aren't working for you, think up your own example. There has to be something for which we have no, uh, no possible evidence. So is this possible or not? So let's think about it. I'll, I'll give you a moment to think. Is this an epistemic possibility? Do not know that it does not obtain. Yeah, of course, that's an epistemic possibility. We do not know that it does not obtain. Um, is it an empirical possibility? Well, no, because by the very design of it, we have no, um, you know, we have no evidence at all uh, pertaining to it. That was the that was the whole goal. Okay, so um, that uh, that now concludes my my sweep through different notions of possibility. Let me now tell you a bit more about the. Uh, about the positive position that I um, uh, that I advocate empirical possibility uh, less briefly um, I, in the paper that you can download I set the the account up with a series of propositions I'll reproduce them here tempting as it is to read them all to you and 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 go over them cause by cause but it, it would be too long and too tedious so let me just point quickly at what the key ideas are Empirical possibility is evidential support. So it inherits a structure from uh, relations of evidential support. That's a very rich structure, very rich set of relations. So that makes possibility a very rich and interesting uh, notion. Uh, it comes in degrees of varying strengths. That's one of the uh, most important things that comes out of the richness of this particular structure. Evidential uh, empirical necessity is evidential compulsion. Now for that, uh, I say that the, uh, that the evidential support has to pass some very high threshold. So the sort of thing that I have in mind here is say energy conservation, at least in normal circumstances. Uh, the evidence in favor of that is very, very high. It has passed whatever this threshold is that we might, um, uh, we might set. So it is an empirical necessity. It's the sort of necessity that you think of in science insofar as you're not thinking of, of, of logical necessity. Um, a uh, limiting case is, of course, um, logical necessity for empirical necessity. If the evidence uh, deductively entails something, it's certainly empirically necessary. Then finally comes another condition that's negotiable. Uh, I want to put it in the list because I find it important. Uh, the notion of possibility is relational. It's possible with respect to some body of evidence. And I'm not interested in just any old body of evidence that you might care to think up hypothetically or counterfactually. I'm interested in the actual evidence that we have, and I want to privilege that. That's the one that I care most about. So I have an evidential actuality condition here. It's negotiable. We can talk about hypothetical or counterfactual notions of empirical possibility by relating them to hypothetical or counterfactual bodies of, of, uh, of, uh, of evidence. There's room to tinker. There are options if you want them. I don't especially, but I'll mention them because they come up. Uh, we have a threshold that, uh, that the strength of support must pass to get necessity. Why not have a similar threshold for, uh, for possibility, some lower level such that the evidence has to be at least this strong before you say it's a possibility, if you like. Uh, and one of the reasons that you might like that is that this then will enable you, at least in some circumstances, to bring back the duality of possibility and necessity. Uh, for that to work, you need an extra condition where you match the uh, uh, the thresholds. Okay, uh, all of this is in the paper. These are these are details. Let me try and pull out what comes out of this uh, that uh, that is noteworthy. Because what comes out of this is that this notion of possibility simply does not conform with the routine expectations of the literature on uh, on on modality. Let me explain how that works. I've mentioned that duality of possibility and necessity. Uh, it's not going to end well here. So let's see how that comes about. Here we have a continuum of strengths of support that goes from all the way from assuredly not to assuredly so. Uh, right in the middle somewhere, we have that there's an Earth-sized planet with one moon near us. Right? Now, depending on how big or small near us is taken to be, you know, there's a fair chance that that's the case. There are so many exoplanets out there that this, you know, this seems quite, you know, quite reasonable. If we make near small enough, it gets a bit less. You know, less well supported, but no matter. Then at this end, at the most assured end, we have something like the conservation of energy, right? Um, it is, you know, it, it, it's one of the strongest necessities that we have in our empirical science for 
for the local stuff. It is not uh, unchallengeable. It is not absolute, absolutely certain. And every now and again, people come up with the idea that maybe it's wrong. Uh, those of you who know a bit of the history of quantum mechanics will know this was entertained with the BKS Borkramer Slater proposal in the early 1920s. Those of you who follow a bit of the history of cosmology uh, will know that the uh, 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 that the um, um, uh, steady state cosmologists of the 50s and 60s were quite happy to entertain the idea that uh, conservation of energy might fail. And I don't know that that cosmology is not doing very well at the moment, but you know, it's, it's not absolutely out of the question that maybe it'll, it'll come back, right? So we then look at the other extreme. Uh, so energy conservation may be violated, rather unlikely really at the extreme end of, of what might happen, but, but, not, uh, but not completely ruled out. So call conservation of energy, no perpetual motion machines P, and call the, uh, the, the, its failure uh, not P. And now that's, let's apply empirical uh, 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 possibility notions to that. Uh, we have necessarily P because we're past that threshold. So we have box P, if you like. And down this end, we have possibly not P, we have diamond uh, not P. And I don't think it takes a huge amount of insight into the way these operators uh, are used to see that, that directly contradicts the duality of, of necessity and possibility. The duality is that necessarily P goes with, it's not the case, but possibly not P. Right, so that goes. Okay, now here's a, Another element that uh, it, it's always sort of been there, uh, but it, it becomes acute that there's a difficulty here, right? Uh, the standard literature almost always works with two notions, possible and necessary. And built into that possible is this huge range of, uh, of ideas. It makes it very coarse and very crude. So, you know, just, just to give you an example of it, go back to Earth-sized planets with one moon near us, Somewhere in the middle, possible, yeah. Uh, 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 nearly assuredly so. Well, that there's an Earth-sized planet somewhere in our galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. That's, you know, that's going to pass almost any threshold that you might like to, to put up there. And what's down here at the other end? Well, when people talk about infinite universes, they like to talk about the idea that somewhere in an infinite universe, there's going to be another Earth-sized planet which duplicates near enough everything, right? Everything that's happening here on earth. It's a perfect clone near enough of everything that's happening here on, on earth. And when you talk about infinite universes, people like to think about that. Uh, but uh, what about that happening near us? I think you'd put that down at the very, very, very low end. So th these are, this is all possibility talk, but the, but the variety of it is, is immense. The variety of sense of, of possibility is really is really quite uh, uh, enormous, and so you get this gradation here. Uh, the existing literature just lumps them all together. It's very coarse. Uh, I find that very unsatisfactory. Every now and again, people will talk about grades of possibility. There's small literature that looks at this. I don't think it's um, it's doing terribly much. Then finally, uh, there's this uh, literature in possible world semantics. It is a literature that is enormously appealing because it reduces the meaning of possibility and necessity claims uh, to things that are adjudicated in set theory, right? So for P to be necessary, necessarily P, just means that P is true in all possible worlds. And for possibly P, it means there exists one possible world in, uh, in, in which it's true. It's very appealing because it, it, it reduces something that's, uh, you know, that's a little hard to grasp, necessity and possibility, reduces it down to something uh, that is set theory. Uh, the only trouble is it, it doesn't work, right? Um, I've just shown you a counterexample to it. Uh, uh, think of all, you know, think of a reasonable construal of all possible worlds. I, I expect that, uh, um, uh, that uh, steady state cosmology is somewhere in there and energy is not conserved in that. So, um, you know, okay. Maybe you want to say, yeah, not in all worlds, but in most. Yeah, and so you're starting on a project that I think is worthwhile. You're saying, well, we can fix the, this possible world semantics by just enriching things a bit. And so, yeah, I agree. And I think that's a, a worthwhile 
endeavor to, uh, to pursue. Uh, let's try and rescue possible world semantics. So let's look at the things that have been causing us, us trouble. Uh, one of them is the sets of possible worlds. What are they? Well, if you're a Lewisian, you, you, you know, you, they're, they're really real, as real as real can be. I'm, I, I'm setting that aside because uh, from what I can tell in the literature, there aren't so many Lewisians out there. Uh, the standard view seems to be something like this, uh, that a possible world uh, 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 is a truth valuation for some set of pro propositions uh, and, the, uh, and the set of all possible worlds is the set of all these truth valuations, right? So that's what, that's what it is to be a possible world. You get a list of propositions and you assign truth values to, to all of them. You've got a world. Now you can see immediately this, this is a little bit too permissive. You know, what goes into that set of propositions? If I can put in any arbitrary fantasy that I like to think of, then I've somehow decreed it possible. And you know, I, you know, I don't know about you, but my fantasies have no obligation to be, uh, to be manifested by the world, right? Or the world has no obligation to manifest my possibilities. So we need some kind of restriction on the set of possibilities. So we get a notion of possibility that has something to do with the world, right? And so which set of, of propositions? Well, I only know of one thing as an empiricist, it's uh, we want propositions that span everything for which there is some evidence, even if it's very, very weak. That seems to be the way to go. Next, we come to this. Um, uh, we have this coarse and flattened relation of possibility. Everything comes out as equally possible. We want to say some things are, uh, are more possible than others. We want some sort of a gauge, right? So we can get differential possibilities. We want this world to be really very possible, but, but only barely so, and this one to be very much more so, right? And again, you know, what, what's, what's the gauge that we're, that we're going to use? Um, well, can I suggest it's simply evidential support? The stronger the evidential support we have for something, uh, the more we should judge it as possible. And I think you can see uh, what's, uh, uh, what, what's happened here. Um, uh, I've simply reconstructed for you the basic claims of empirical possibility, All right? So you see, I keep coming back to uh, uh, to where I started. Okay, so you know, at this at this point, I'm um, moving in a, a different mode. I've my investigations have come to a point where where I'm thinking, okay, I think I understand what's going on somehow, and I don't know how. The literature on modality has taken a, a, a turn; it's gone off the rails. I don't know uh, quite what happened. So I started to think about what what are the influences here that are driving this literature. There are many, but there's one in particular that, that, uh, uh, that struck out to, to me as being especially important. And this is the influence of, of modal formal logic. I think it's had a, a strong influence and is responsible for at least uh, some of what we see here. So how does this work? I know I'm getting to the end of my time, so I'll move along fairly quickly here. So, so how does this work? Uh, well, one of the basic sources for this modern tradition uh, is Saul Kripke's uh, work in the modal logic S5, his 1959 proof of the, of the completeness of a version of S5. This has had an, a, uh, an, an outsized uh, place in this particular literature. And you'll find uh, the ideas that I'm talking about here, the ones that are bothering me, they're all in this, uh, in this paper. So for example, early on here, you get the duality, uh, possibly A is defined as not necessarily not A, that's a version of the duality. Uh, what about uh, truth conditions? Uh, these are the uh, truth conditions in, uh, in modal logic S5 star equals, right? And uh, I could read you that whole paragraph, but um, I, I don't want to do that for obvious reasons. Fortunately, Kripke tells us uh, how to read it. Uh, the basis of the informal analysis which motivated these definitions is that a proposition is necessary if and only if it is true and all possible. Uh, in, all, in, in all possible worlds. Okay, so we have the basic structures that we've been dealing with here in, uh, in the logic. How should, we, how should we think about them? Well, uh, we can go back to the source of, of this logic. Uh, the logic was proposed by Lewis and Langford. This is where S5 is first proposed in their logic book of 32, reprinted 1959. And they tell us very clearly how we are to think of this notion of possibility and necessity. Uh, here, here's the a short discussion, but here's the page on which it happens. I know you can't read that, so I'll, I'll pluck out the bits that, that matter. Uh, they emphasize 
that the notion of possibility that they are describing with their logic is, an, is a logical notion. It is the notion of logical conceivability or the absence of, uh, of, uh, of self-contradiction, right? So do they realize that there are other notions of possibility out there? Yes, they do. Uh, and they're very clear about this. A second and colloquially more frequent meaning of possible, impossible, and necessary has reference to the relation which the proposition or thing considered has to some state of affairs, such as to give such as given data or to knowledge, blah blah blah. blah. So it goes on. We can read more if you uh, uh, if you want. Which one are they talking about? They're very very clear. They're talking about the first one, and we don't want to get them uh, mixed up. Uh, because they're frequently confused and the results are fatal to the understanding of logical principles. So they just want their possibility and necessity to be, uh, to be purely uh, logical notions, not something, uh, not something bigger. So, so what, what's happened here? Well, it's a little hard to, to track Kripke's uh, path. So we go to the, I guess as the gospel according to St. Saul, this seems to be the, the most read literature here. You find autobiographical material early on in which uh, Kripke describes himself as working immediately after, you know, at the same time as he's working on S5, he's developing these ideas, naming a necessity there, uh, and he's using uh, the, uh, uh, the results of the formal logic uh, as a model. They're the inspiration uh, for it. Now, I don't want to commit the genetic fallacy, uh, that he thought up these ideas at the inspiration of, of, of things that happen in, um, uh, in, 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 in formal modal logic. I don't want to accuse him of, of simply treating formal logic as metaphysics, formal modal logic as metaphysics, but um, well, that seems to be what, what's happened. Uh, people now seem to treat modal logic as uh, metaphysics. And so, you know, here's a yeah, so in the, this work simply pulls out um, uh, a notion of, 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 of rigid designation out of the semantics that live within uh, uh, that live, live within uh, S five. Okay, so um, what does uh, Kripke think of this? Um, I have trouble making sense of this. I think he has visited this upon us. There's no question historically in the way that people are reading it. Uh, that he at once seems to like it and be horrified by it. So you'll find him uh, deprecating talk of possible worlds as anything more than, than purely logical. Uh, the term possible world may also mislead. Perhaps it suggests a foreign country, uh, the foreign country picture. Uh, the apparatus of possible worlds has, I hope, been very useful as far as the sit theoretic, model theoretic, model theory of quantified modal logic is concerned, but has encouraged philosophical pseudo problems and misleading pictures. Okay, so let me summarize what I think has happened. What I see is that there are a number of conveniences that come up when you're doing things like proving the completeness of, of the modal logic S5, right? So to have a semantics in which uh, to be necessary is to be true in all possible worlds is very simple, it's very easy semantics to work with. It makes, makes your results possible. It's certainly a great deal easier than having some sort of evidential measure, which is the sort of thing that I've been advocating. That, that's, going to make, that's going to make things really quite intractable. Uh, the coarseness of mere possibility and necessity, well, it's tough enough proving anything, uh, but if you have a binary, binary notions like this, uh, that keeps the, the, the logic tractable. Uh, what about this duality of possibility and, and necessity? Well, it's a, it's a kind of a familiar figure, these dualities in, in, uh, uh, in, in formal logic. It, it mimics the duality of for all and there exists and the semantics that come with it, very similar to the sort of semantics that come with universal and existential quantification. That's fine if, you, if, if, if your focus is S5 formal logic and you want to prove completeness, you know, I understand you've got to simplify. Uh, but please, let's not now think that these uh, pragmatically induced simplifications are giving us the founding truths of modal metaphysics, right? That we've now learned something about, the, uh, 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 about possibilities in, in ultimate reality. And if you think about it, you know, S5 has a short list of, 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 of postulates. Um, uh, Possibility in the world is not that is not not that simple. That that short list is going to 
it is going to capture everything. Okay, so let me wind down. I've gone a couple of minutes past what I wanted to. Uh, this is what I promised you in the talk, an empirical account of possibility, uh, an argument that these two notions are the only two that can be responsibly used, uh, uh, that uh, these notions then don't allow, in particular the, the empirical notion, uh, don't, uh, don't allow uh, the, many of the standard moves that, that, that happen in, um, uh, in, in, in the modality literature. Um, I promised I'd tell you where to read. Uh, if you go to my website, it looks something like this on the first page. Here is a link to a paper that has that figure for the round, uh, for the round square. And this paper will pop up. And, and if, you've, if you haven't had enough, uh, you can read that and find pretty much everything I've said and a lot more uh, right in there. So uh, what more is there to say? More, thank you, John. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, screen relinquished.